Retribution was a colossal failure. In fact, it might go down as the worst major VR launch title of all time. Now I should back up and say that I'm not really new in the community. Obviously, if you've seen any of my content, you have know that I've been posting videos on this game for about two years now, and have been playing since before the Quest release. It honestly pains me to make this video because I really enjoyed the first game to its fullest, going as far as to break every world record there was for the game, including the trial which I unironically still suffer insomnia from. So strap in everyone, it's gonna be a long one. When we first got word that a sequel was in development, to nobody's surprise, we were all excited. And this was significantly amplified when the first trailer for the game dropped. And in case you were wondering, yes, I was the reason that the trailer ended up leaking a week early. For those that don't know, someone in control of the Skydance YouTube page ended up setting their trailer to premiere on the 20th of April, which was the same day as the Metagames Showcase. The trailer wasn't shown since it was just a premiere, but people knew it existed, and for whatever reason, I ended up going back to that URL that the trailer was on, and they had set it to unlisted, meaning anyone with the link could view the entire trailer. Now, I didn't really spread it to many people, uh, but someone did end up spreading it, uh, of whom I won't name, and pretty much everybody in the community that had a name ended up seeing this trailer, and so I had to inform the good people at Skydance that uh, this was happening. But either way, the trailer had us hyped, uh, since it not only showed that it was the same engine as the first game, but that we were getting new particle effects, new walker interactions with them falling, and the grandiose, a chainsaw. The chainsaw was pretty much the number one selling point for the game, to the point that people started to actually use their brains and realize it wouldn't work too well, considering you can just shoot everything with an assault rifle. But nevertheless, it ended up sparking a chain of events that would ultimately lead to the heaping pile of dog shit the game currently is. In case you aren't an avid member of the community at this point, let me fill you in. It started back when a bunch of cryptic puzzles were getting sent to various YouTubers and TikTokers to advertise the game, similar to what Treyarch did for Black Ops Cold War. The only difference is they picked the most random list of individuals I have ever seen. When you think of a Saints and Sinners content creator, what are some of the first names that come to mind? You're probably thinking GNQ Gaming, Substatica, White Arrow VR, Dr. Bread. You want to know who they picked to advertise the game? V Bunny. Has anyone in the community actually heard of this person? Hey, grab your book. Get in line! And I'm not bashing V Bunny in specific, I'm just wondering who at Skydance thought it was a good idea to get random TikTokers to help build the lore of their game. Someone who actually played the game like once ever. They did also send a BMF VR package and I believe a gamer tag as well, which did have some actual puzzles to solve. But man, we were on the case 1000%. All of us were searching, trying to piece clues together, trying to use Caesar ciphers to get the URL for what was ultimately a big pile of nothing at first. It was literally just a website where you could put in some, I guess, email login information, and that was it. I also honestly believe that if it weren't for us, the puzzle would have never been solved because of how little of a shit everyone in the community gave. Like genuinely, we posted the solution around half an hour after it was launched and no one in the SDI Discord batted an eye. Even the MetaQuest uh, account ended up tweeting something about helping BMF VR uh, try and solve the puzzle. We had solved it two hours prior. Throughout the next couple of months, various teasers and videos were being released showing different gameplay and story elements, which at the time were incredibly juicy to dissect given that we knew very little about the game thus far. Of course, we were hyped uh, about the game because of the trailers, they showed us what we wanted to see, uh, and as you'll soon find out, that was hardly delivered on. As we got closer to the release of the Quest version, because of course they wanted to release on that platform first, we started to notice that there was no way to pre-order the game, despite there being pre-order exclusives, and that was one of, again, the main selling points to the game. This was, by the way, never mentioned or fixed by Skydance until the game had launched, so that's great. It was also mentioned that you'd be able to import your save from Chapter 1 if you had one, although this wasn't even available on launch. Once again, they never mentioned this until the game had released. 
When the game did finally come out, however, it felt like a good experience, mostly because I was too captivated by the fact that it was new. And of course, it wouldn't be retribution without being riddled with bugs and issues, though surprisingly enough, the day one version of Chapter 2 on Quest was more enjoyable than it is today. They have unironically made the game worse over time by adding new patches into the game. But let's put the bugs aside for now, because whoever is writing the storylines at Skydance needs to be replaced instantly. Let me introduce you to Sable's crew. You've got Sable, who has literally no personality. You've got Barnes, who barely speaks in the game and just sits there. And you've got Echo. You cannot tell me with a straight face that Echo is from the brutal reclaimed known for hanging people upside down and taking part in ritualistic sacrifices while he has a pair of fucking animal ears on his helmet. Which, come to think of it, is Echo even male or female? I genuinely cannot tell, so I'm just going to refer to it as a mistake. Not to mention, Echo also talks like he's a 12-year-old who has a stuffy nose all the time. Tourist, thanks for coming. Though I will admit, the first mission that this crew gives you is actually sort of interesting. You have an actual objective unlike every mission in Chapter 1, which were just glorified fetch quests. You're supposed to take JB's last sermon to the radio station to broadcast it in the French Quarter. Of course, no one knows who JB is because everyone who played Chapter 1 moved on to something else by now, but, you know, that's not important. And yes, there is a section in the journal that explains who the characters are, but who actually reads any of that? Anyways, you end up getting to the radio station and fighting through tower troops, only to find out they yanked the generator and left in a truck, which I believe is the only time we've seen an actual working vehicle in the game. And afterwards, you get contacted by Sable to meet back in the reserve to grow the mystery as to why they'd need generators, after all, adding more questions into the player's head. Then we get a message from the guy we've all been waiting to see, the Pawn King. The Pawn King is described as a fast-talking wheeler dealer, and he definitely acts the part until he sends you into an ambush willingly twice just to save his own ass. The first task he gives you is going to the recording studio in Hotel Eclair for some 9-volt batteries. You know, the same batteries that you can find everywhere else during the nighttime and in the resting area. Nevertheless, it just ends up being an ambush set up by the Axeman, or Garrick. It was terrifying at first, meeting the Axeman for the first time, until you realize that it's literally just a four minute monologue that you can't skip until you glitch out through the hole you fell through. Not the best time for me right now. This was actually pretty ominous though, since you're very close to Garrick distance wise, and he's choosing to toy with you before attempting to kill you. Although they really did not bother adding any of the player's choices from chapter one, despite that being a main selling point for the game. That you, tourist? That's me. No matter what ending you chose in Chapter 1, the dialogue options will all be the exact same when confronting Garrick. And by the way, this also goes for the journal tab that talks about what all happened in Chapter 1. They couldn't even be bothered to change some text depending on what you chose. It's all vague and means literally nothing. Sunny does give you one interesting mission though, the one that was teased to death in the trailers, which is the speakeasy, that is, quote unquote, infested with walkers. Now to some, it might be infested, but there's maybe 10 walkers in this entire building that are an actual threat. If you go back and look at the trailers, there are a lot more walkers than 10. I'm not sure why they decided to rapidly kill down the walker count for this mission, but to each their own. And afterwards, the part where Father Carter gets chased by the Axeman into the speakeasy, forcing us to make some split-second decisions where we had to escape from the Axeman was pretty cool, except it never happened. This was a defining moment in my playthrough for sure, as it was very clear that's how this mission was going to end with a mini-boss battle against the Axeman, which would have been incredibly unique and something to keep the players on their toes, and they just didn't do that. The Axeman was super hyped up as a nemesis or Mr. X enemy. That means nothing to me because I don't play Resident Evil, by the way. That would have been an active threat throughout the game that we'd actually have to take heed of, but we only ever see him twice in the game before fighting him one-on-one. -on -one. Unless you count those weird rooftop stare-downs he does, but I'd much rather him actually come down and face the tourist. And what's even worse is in the files there is an Axeman event, which is in the same area as the cache locations, like those files. So it was very clear that this was intended from the start, but they just didn't do that. Among a bunch of other weird things that I'm going to talk about later. 
It was clear that there were big ambitions by the development team that they definitely wanted and had the means to do, but were otherwise forced to make something completely different. And this will only get more and more clearer as we go along in this video. And yes, I skipped over the Lola mission because it's literally just another fetch quest, though it is interesting to see how the area is overrun and we have to carefully traverse the battlefield, though it's not really much of a battlefield and more just a regular mission where it happens to be at night. And they also cut down the AI count significantly, especially for this mission. If you go back, there's a video, I don't remember who posted it, but I'll show it on screen. It was a video showing this mission prior to release, and there were a lot of enemies. There were also a lot of items that didn't end up making the final cut, but it's still just worrying why they just didn't do this. And it's not like the game can't handle this many AI at once, like it clearly can. If you opened up a debug menu or installed the God phone or the God menu, and you spawned in like 20 different AI, have them shoot at each other, it might slow down a little bit, but for the most part, it'll do just fine. Obviously with Retribution, it's not really the same because the optimization on this game is the worst fucking thing I've ever seen in my life. But, you know, that, besides that. But don't worry, it gets worse. Sunny gives you another mission, which ends up being another setup to get you killed, which is going after the Axeman, although it ends up being a tower ambush. The boss fight against the Axeman is sort of decent, though it just follows the three super hit system most games use. Though I will say, his walking speed being almost as fast as your running speed is absolutely terrifying, and it makes me wish that they had actually used his character in combat more, since he has a bunch of abilities like breaking open doors and killing walkers. The Garrick boss fight was actually one of the highlights for at least the gameplay perspective, because they did end up doing something different. Chapter 1, like I said, the entirety of it was fetch quests. There was very little actual player interactivity with specific things you need to do besides the pump regulators, and that's about it. Everything else was go here, grab this, and shoot some pre-placed enemies. And it's sort of the same for this game, but they did do a little more innovation with some of the missions, which I do like. But it just feels like there was so much more we were supposed to be able to do that we just never ended up doing. And once you come back from said mission, you'll find Desiree, Sunny's daughter, holding a gun to his head for what can only be described as obvious reasons. It didn't take until a month or two after beating the game that I realized you could actually save Sunny depending on your dialogue choices, although it does literally nothing for the game. But anyway, after that whole fiasco, you have arguably the buggiest mission in the game, which is to sneak into the tower at night and find that Mama is batshit insane. Somehow, this mission worked better on the Day 1 Quest version than it currently does as I'm writing the script for this video on the PC version. And if you're wondering why I'm making that distinction, the Quest version is notoriously more unstable than the PC version is. Although, they're both very unstable. What ends up happening is when you go to meet Sable in the parking garage, for some reason she just never walks over to where the conversation is happening and just chills out in the hallway. Also, who the fuck are these two people? They never speak, they're never named, and they never show up again in the entire story. They're literally just there to stand there and do nothing. Kind of like how in the trailer there were two completely random guys in the reserve that were removed and never heard from again. After you discover Mama's plan to wipe out everyone still left in the city and turning it into an uninhabitable hellscape, you meet up with Sable and crew once again outside the hospital. Only, for some ungodly reason, the tower troops that are scripted to walk outside the hospital still do in this mission, constantly interrupting the cutscene if not breaking it entirely. This is the latest version of Retribution, by the way. This is, uh... This is what the game is in its current state. And fucking Echo's dead. God damn it. This wasn't even an issue for the quest version on day one, which I just, it baffles my mind how this is even happening, among everything else in this game. On the off chance that the dialogue does work, you're ambushed by the tower and everyone in Sable's crew dies and nobody ends up missing them. And then the start of the final mission commences, the calm before the storm, as you realize that Mama is about to enact her plan and reap havoc across the entire city. You only have so much time to prepare. And then everyone just ended up sleeping through each day because they couldn't be bothered to put up with the bullshit anymore. <laughs> Finally, the bells ring, and you have to go back to the tower and kill Mama, because it was a brilliant idea to wait for her to gain the upper hand before doing fuck all about it. 
When I went into this mission on my one-handed playthrough, the game was so bugged from the previous mission that it tried loading both the final tower missions at the same time, meaning I had spawned at the complete opposite side of the map and actually had to no-clip my way through a physical barrier just to progress. Obviously, it should go without saying, but if you need third-party mods to actually beat your game, your game should not be available for purchase. Also, who rallied the exiles up? Who gave them all weapons? They all show up to the final fight as if there was some radio broadcast or something to inform them that this was happening, despite the Taurus being the last standing person to actually know what was happening. Now you could argue that the random people in Sable's group also knew, but they weren't at the hospital to be informed of Mama's plan. Even still, the tower knew that the Taurus was sneaking around and for some reason just waited to launch an ambush on them. But just when you thought it couldn't get any worse, this final mission is an absolute tragedy on the Quest 2 and Pico 4 versions of the game. If you thought it was dark on PC or PSVR 2, think again my friend, it is pitch fucking black on Quest. Wow, it is dark. You literally cannot see the enemy shooting at you unless you have the alert detections on. Not to mention, there are a lot of enemies in this mission, some of which are eradicators, which need more than just shooting at them to take them down. You wouldn't know this, of course, because it's just too goddamn dark to see anything. What's even worse is that this was not the case on day one. They purposefully changed it to be this way after the game had launched, as it was more realistic than it was before. Keep in mind as well, this mission takes place at no earlier than 4 or 5 in the morning, since when you go up into the tower, it's easily 7 o'clock and bright as day outside. As far as I'm aware, this is still in the game on the mobile headset versions. It is still impossible to tell what's going on, even for veteran players, let alone people who haven't played the games for a year straight. Also, the AI in this game are just complete dog shit, if you haven't noticed that already. You could give me a week to make a better AI than this game, and I could probably do it with the little to no unreal knowledge that I have. And yes, I have dabbled in the arts before. Now all the bugs and issues aside, it was nice to finally climb the tower floor by floor, taking out a bunch of enemies along the way. It was something that was heavily teased in chapter 1, and now we can finally do it in chapter 2. One thing as well about this map is that you finally get to see the city from a bird's eye view. Now I'm going to be real for a second. Graphics are the last thing I care about in a game. If a game is fun, it can be pixels for all I care. The gameplay must come first when developing a title. Anyone who says otherwise might as well just be watching a movie. But oh my god, the view of this city is absolutely atrocious. You know it's bad when the view of the city is comparable to that of Spider-Man on the PS2, which mind you came out in 2002. Not to mention the fact that you can't identify where any of the other maps are in the game. You can see the bridge, which should be next to Rampart, but it just isn't. One of the biggest hopes I had for this map was being able to accurately point out where each map is according to where it is on the clipboard map, such as the Blue Mansion, the radio stations in the Ward and Bourbon Street, Rampart High School, the Garden District, but it's just a gray mess. And while I'm on the subject, what happened to the all-out war that was happening just a moment prior? Everyone on the floor just seems to have up and vanished. Obviously, it wouldn't make sense to have a full AI battle that you'd never take part in, but fuck, man, some tracers would have been nice at least. Even Halo Reach had massive battles in the background that actually did change when you completed certain objectives. And of course, as well, there are buildings behind the tower that you'll just never see and only take up more processing power. Because here at Skydance Interactive, we don't like optimizing our games and will only do it if the name is PSVR 2. At least we did get a climbing section while hanging over the 45-story drop from the top of the tower. Though it would have been cool to have that one scene in the trailer where you had to punch the walker and drop it down into the area below. And yes, you used to be able to survive the fall off the fucking tower. 45 stories and all you need is a bandage to walk that off. I'm not even sure that they fixed the fall damage issue because they just added a kill barrier for when you fall down now. Excellent choice, guys. And after all of that, you are finally confronted with Mama, which once again, the level of detail they put into her penthouse alone is astonishing. It was probably meant to be the new resting area once you beat the game, but they just didn't end up doing that, I guess. And now you're rewarded with a 10 minute long monologue with Mama. 
Of course, you could just shoot her and skip to Henri's monologue, but if you want to get the good ending, you have to listen to her talk so she'll drop the key you need. Trust me, I've tried cheesing it. It's probably not possible. Welcome to hell, tourist. Mate, where did the key go? And there you have it. That's the game finished. Now, back in chapter one, when you finished the story, you were given a little message saying, thanks for playing our game. There's still more stuff to do. They couldn't even do that. When you beat the game, there is literally nothing else to do besides slugging through all of the exile trade networks if you didn't already. Which, by the way, you gain absolutely nothing for doing all of them, so don't bother if that's what you're looking for. Chapter 1 still had like several recipes and secrets to find after you completed the story to unlock new weapons, explore new areas, but here it's just nothing. There's not even beggars or muggers to find, despite them still being in the files and working to a T. No new weapons, nothing. It was just a flat-out disappointment in every single aspect. And a lot of people say that this game feels like a glorified DLC for Chapter 1, and they're not entirely wrong, because if you look in the files for the game, it has the exact same structure as Chapter 1 did. And a lot of what they used for Chapter 2 was put in a folder labeled, I shit you not, DLC 2. The first DLC would have either been the Trial Update or Aftershocks, though Aftershocks was meant to be what Chapter 2 was, since they were making both at the exact same time. That's also why the update completely fucked the performance on every platform the game was on, by the way. It's even more of a slap in the face when you look through the files and see all of the cut content that was supposed to make it into the game. Like, did you know that you were originally meant to contact Sonny on Channel 13 and find out that Garrick kidnapped him and Desiree, forcing you to save them? Or that you were meant to ambush Garrick in the tunnels with C4 charges from Whistles? The Lola mission was also supposed to be different where you end up going to Bastion and talking to Barnes of all people and having to defend the duplex from attackers. Do you understand how insane it would have been to have a tower defense segment in the duplex? Having the tower push assault after assault while you form a plan to escape, actually using the different traps that we have in the game that never were used prior. But for whatever reason, they decided to just not do any of these things, because why not? And the worst part is, I'm almost positive that once the PSVR 1 version releases for this game, that'll be it. No new updates, no new support, nothing. The QA testers for Skydance have already moved on to their next game, Behemoth, which you can gamble on how you think that'll turn out. I, I think I'm just going to stick to the sidelines and watch this time. Just about the only saving grace this game has are the mods that have been made thus far, which if you're not aware, the PC version has a good amount of mods, including the God Phone, which has been released for Chapter 2, and some custom maps, somehow adding more content that the community actually wanted than fucking Skydance did. Overall, Retribution is just a mistake of a game. I'd genuinely be surprised if they add anything new or fix any of the still game-breaking bugs left in the game. The list of things they'd have to fix pretty much boils down to fix the AI, fix the story, fix the lighting, fix the weapon glitches, fix the gameplay, fix the performance, fix the entire game, and re-add the trial because it's basically already done. And then we might have, dare I say, a full game. A worthy sequel to the game that was released with passion and care nearly three and a half years ago.